Hello and welcome to this webinar titled Single Use Systems in Biologics Manufacturing and Their Impact on Operational Technology. Hosted by Biopharma Asia Magazine and presented by Dr. Gloria Gidea Lopez, John McGuire, Mark Maselli, and Kenneth Clapp. My name is Sri Patel and I will be the moderator. Before we begin, I would just like to remind our viewers that this event will be hosting a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time throughout the presentation via the questions tab located at the bottom of your screen and we will go through these at the end of the presentation. Now please allow me to introduce you to our presenters. Gloria Gidea Lopez, PhD, is Director of Business Operations Management at the Shire Lexington, Massachusetts manufacturing site. She has over 15 years of experience implementing electronic applications for biopharmaceutical manufacturing and their associated compliance practices. She has led the deployment of integrated tools for data analytics, manufacturing execution systems, MES, historians, machine vision, and more recently, finite scheduling. She holds degrees in chemical engineering, food science, and a PhD in biosystems engineering. Her team is responsible for business operations analysis and operations technology for the Lexington, Massachusetts Biologic site. Of particular interest is the impact of single-use systems on MES, automation, and data analytics. John McGuire is the Associate Director of Manufacturing Systems at Shire's Lexington, Massachusetts site. His main area of expertise is the application of process engineering and operational technology for life sciences. He has over 15 years of process engineering experience, including functional specification deployment and startup of several drug substance manufacturing facilities in Ireland and the United States. John led the design and onboarding of single-use systems for Shire's Lexington, Massachusetts manufacturing facility, which won an honorable mention for Facility of the Year in 2011. As a subject matter expert, John provides operation technology perspective for ERP and more recently to finite scheduling systems at Shire. John holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Natural Science. Mark Maselli is the program owner responsible for the single-use systems lifecycle and is a senior engineer in the business operations management group at Shire's Lexington, Massachusetts site. He has expertise in the design, development and maintenance of single-use technologies as an end user in the biotechnology industry for over five years. Previously, he worked as a process engineer, specializing in single-use technologies, manufacturing operations, and polymer extrusion. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and a Master of Science in Engineering Management. His experience, single-use knowledge, and education gives him a personal working knowledge of the application of single-use technologies in the biotechnology industry. Finally, we have Kenneth Clapp, who is a senior manager at GE Healthcare, focusing on applications, technology, and integration. Kenneth holds a bachelor's degree in biology with a specialization in subcellular biology. He received a master's degree in bio biological engineering focused on biological control systems, mathematical modeling, and instrumentation. Early in his career, he worked as a cell culture technologist produced antigens and antibodies in large scale, and developed hollow fiber-based bioreactors. Spanning four decades, Kenneth has worked in a variety of roles with bioprocess equipment manufacturers, including field service, sales and marketing, applied research and development, quality assurance, automation, and operations management. He has been managing bioprocessing equipment capital projects, including supply oversight, documentation, and ERP integration. I would now like to invite our presenters for the first half of this pre presentation, Dr. Gloria Gidea Lopez, Mark Maselli, and John McGuire to join our webinar. Welcome, Gloria, Mark, and John. Thank you, Sri. I would like to start by thanking Biopharma Asia for this opportunity and the audience for listening to this presentation. We would like to share with you some of our experiences implementing single-use systems and operating a facility for the, for the production of biologics. In 2008, Shire broke ground for the build-out of a new multi-product facility located in Lexington, Massachusetts. And in 2010, the first batch of commercial product material was produced here. 
We know now that the ability to commission and start production in a relatively short period was due to the fact that we were utilizing single-use technology. Since then, we have realized multiple benefits, and some of them are outlined here, mainly reducing significantly the risk of contamination, the reduction of utility and upfront capital costs. We achieve the anticipated scalability and flexibility of the process. At the Lexington site here at Shire, we have maximized the utilization of single-use systems across the entire manufacturing process, from single-use uh, utilizing cell culture to storage of solution and drug substance. And here are some examples of the process steps where disposable components are utilized. You can see here that um, starting with cell culture, we utilize bags for cell expansion, harvest hold, media preparation, and during recovery for the buffer preparation and hold and storage, and for holding intermediates after the chromatography steps. You will see there at the end um, in the section dedicated to storage that we also utilize single-use systems for holding and storing our drug substance. In this presentation, you will be hearing first a description of the single-use systems life cycle with an overview of the steps and the critical aspects that need to be considered, designed, and that need to be anticipated prior to the facility build-out. In our experience, we know that the success of using single-use technologies relies on the knowledge of the manufacturing steps and the upfront definition of how we intend to operate the facility. Later, you will be hearing about how electronic systems, mainly NES, automation tool, process data analytics, need to be configured in a correct manner, and the system themselves need to include appropriate functionality that enables the correct operation and process monitoring of facilities that use single use. We will also talk in the second half about the impact to warehouse and materials management, scheduling of plant operation, and last but not least, we'll talk about the impact of systems used for process monitoring and data analytics. Now, John McGuire will be discussing the life cycle of single-use materials used during the production of a batch. Thank you, Gloria. As Gloria stated, uh, the Lexington Manufacturing Plant has, has an extensive use of single-use systems in, in all phases of our production, from a bio, our vial saw and cell culture all the way through to the bulk drug filtration and freezing. During production, each single-use system has a product life cycle that consists of setup, end use, and system breakdown. All of these stages of the life cycle need to be accommodated for during any operational technology selection, such as MES, or uh, system interface configuration and, and batch record design. So manufacturing plants that use traditional stainless steel systems, they also have the stages to set up for setup in use and system breakdown. In, in these cases, stainless steel plants rely mostly on validated, automated CIPs and SIP cycles and they perform with a certain amount of predictability, and the focus of these plants is mainly on the equipment management and the hygienic status. However, in manufacturing plants that use single-use systems, there's an increased emphasis on the accuracy of the built of materials and detailed standard operating procedures to ensure the proper system setup. The stainless steel equipment is now replaced by single-use systems. It's really materials that need to be managed as materials as well as, well as equipment. So accurate bills of materials and accurate forecasts is a necessity in order to ensure that material planning can be performed accurately. And this also impacts the supplier of the single-use system, such as GE, and in turn that affects their suppliers as well to make sure that we can get the material to the sites in time and in stock. It also ensures that we have correct quantities of the right materials that are picked and kitted by warehouse personnel 
and get staged at the right time for production. Once materials, material kits are staged and moved onto the shop floor, manufacturing technicians are required to perform a thorough material inspections prior to system installation. They also perform tubing welds, tubing welds bag inflations. These are rubber parts, you know, plastic parts that are being assembled on the manufacturing floor. If during the inspection or setup materials we found to be defective, sometimes this can get caused by damage that occurs during the handling process, um, implementation of proper, the implementation of proper warehouse management and ERP interfaces can help make sure that those replacement materials are available to prevent any delays in production. The ERP, ERP interface will also enable technicians to perform material checks on the spot to ensure that single-use materials are in the correct stock status prior to use. And then they can also perform the material takeouts from inventory upon the consumption, and they, maintain, they can maintain batch genealogy and traceability. Once system setup is finished, the system moves to its in-use stage. And you can see that we have systems in use in this picture on the slide. We show buffer bags that are filled with buffer and they're staged and they're ready for production. This is in our purification area where we have a um, combination of stainless steel equipment and also single-use equipment that's used together. This picture here shows a bag that's filled with um, some solution. This is a prototype bag that one of our suppliers allowed us to use for testing in order to um, make sure that it was going to be suitable for use on the manufacturing floor. Once the system is in use, um, an MES system must allow for equipment for material placements to occur in the event of a failure. Uh, these requirements are needed because this does happen on the manufacturing floor. We've seen cases where we've had filters filed and they need to be replaced uh, during the middle of production, or we've seen bags that are filling split on the sides and on seams, and these need to be also taken out of production and replaced with material. So any MES system and batch record uh, that we that is implemented needs to accommodate this um, this fact of life that happens when you implement, implement single use systems, and it must also apply for this unplanned material to be available and introduced to the process and maintain the original material in the batch genealogy if that does happen. Then once in use is completed, it moves into a system breakdown stage where system breakdown and MES system needs to allow for the ability to perform filter integrity testing provide step instructions to break down in the proper order and dispose of properly as well. In, in order to have a successful implementation, we need to have a clear understanding on how to operate. One of the tools to help with that understanding that we have at Shire are these process maps. The, the process maps were created for each product we manufacture at Shire, and they're based on international ISA 95 and S88 standards. These process maps have, are a visual representation of our manufacturing process. And they're organized in a hierarchy. The highest level is the procedure. The next level down is unit procedure. And then the operation at the lowest level is the phase. At each level, maps will show different levels of detail, such as boundaries of SAP in the process order, when bills of materials are pulled in, and when goods receipt transactions are performed to place manufactured material into inventory. At the operation level and at the phase level, process maps can show activities that are performed in parallel or they can be either or activities. <clears throat> the lowest level, which is the phase level, this also corresponds with the work instruction on the batch record. It shows interfaces with our process automation system, uh, shows material usage per step, process data that gets recorded for, in, during manufacturing, any samples that are uh, pulled at, at each step, LINS interfaces, shows equipment that are used, and also SOP references at each step as well. Process maps can also help with the batch record creation, or whether you're converting from electronic, from paper to electronic, or for a new facility that's going straight to electronic. They can also help with the verification of the batch record to ensure accuracy once the batch record is completed. Now I'll turn the presentation back over to Gloria we'll be discussing some more specifics involved with the processing. Thank you, John. There are multiple areas that are impacted by the implementation of single-use systems, but here we'll be highlighting key aspects of the following. Warehouse and materials management, 
equipment management, scheduling, the configuration of master batch records of MES, and the impact on the preparatory stages and all the elements are considered for the proper operation of data analytic systems. The stars that you see here are intentionally applied, I would say, because in our experience, these are the areas where we have benefited the most from collaboration with our suppliers of single-use systems. This chart here is an, our attempt to illustrate the impact of utilizing single-use systems on finite, finite scheduling. The uh, ascending line uh, about with uh, the dotted line that shows finite scheduling really indicates the higher variability that has been observed in facilities that utilize single-use systems. With this implementation, we know that now we are adding to the process new steps that had to do with the actual setup, the inspection, and all those details that you heard from John's presentation. But in addition to the higher number of new steps, you also see higher variability that depends on the operator's ability first to uh, configure the systems to inspect and operate them with experience that is expected to go down, but in the beginning we see that is higher variability and there are studies that have documented this really well. Another area of impact that we see is uh, in equipment status functionality. Typically, the EQM or equipment management module of MES that typically will rely, will rely on that uh, for the understanding of stainless steel status, hygienic status, clean hold, clean expire, in use, or clean. Those no longer apply when we have a facility that operates with single use. The more we implement those systems, the less we depend on that functionality because the, probably the fundamental change that we'll observe is that we move on from understanding our equipment as true equipment and instead we consider it material. So we'll see an increase on ERP and the need for the proper MES configurations to bring clear bills of materials with the correct information that describe our processes or the materials that will be utilized in the process instead. So since the material impact is probably the highest area of interest and where a lot of the um, emphasis will go and the effort for the proper configuration, uh, we analyze in terms of the numbers of materials that we have now and classify them into these categories, chemicals, laboratory equipment, and single-use technologies. To our surprise, um, uh, this was very eye-opening, and you'll be hearing more when Mark Marcelli presents. Single-use technologies, the sheer number of components that we utilize represent about 71% of the materials that are managed in our facilities. The impact then on the warehouse practices and materials management is very significant. It requires a lot of attention and upfront work. We need to make sure that with the increased emphasis on material master data and bills of materials, we account for all the components that are be going to be utilized, the primary components and alternatives, and that those bills of materials are complete and that offer the entire picture of everything that is anticipated for use. And this will dictate the success of materials management in systems, for example, like NES. We'll see also that there is a significant increase in the number of items in the bill of materials. And there is emphasis also on the traceability of the consumption for genealogy reporting, as you will see, you will see some examples later, and also for cost analysis of raw material cost at the end of the batch and uh, accuracy of inventory via interfaces back to MES where you want to account correctly for the consumption of these materials via interfaces between ERP and MES. And the next slide discusses the emphasis and how it changes the focus from equipment management to material management. We hinted at that 
before, and here are more specifics. If we think from the perspective of equipment management in NES or with paper logs, we see that in facilities with stainless steel, the complexity of those logs or the management increases. That is, the equipment management models need to be very comprehensive and detailed. NES will be tracking the equipment availability and uh, clean status. The bill of equipment will be required as part of the batch record, and there will be more extensive use of equipment logbooks, of course. In the case of single use, we see that the reliance on those equipment models is lower. Therefore, the complexity in their configuration decreases. We simplified the equipment management models. MES will be tracking the materials that are cons consumed, the system set up or in use, per the discussion that you heard from John McGuire on the life cycle. And then uh, we will see that we need to rely more on the information provided by our vendor on the single sourcing, as well as information on multiple alternative materials. The lead times are very important. And we see then in summary that the dependency changes from equipment management to stock status of single-use systems in ERP. In the next slides, I would like to mention key areas of impact that we have seen on our data analytics. The ultimate goal is to collect detailed data and information about the consumption of our single-use systems and connect them to a batch so that we can have a general visualization and understanding of how changes, potential changes to a material and their variability can be impact the yield of our process and the quality of the product. We start with data that we collect in procurement, and these are usually data from certificates of analysis and the age of single-use systems based on their date of manufacturing. We also collect new information during the QC quality control inspection of those materials, and then we collect process information where we are tracking details of our process and our yield and the operation in general through the entire um, process set. And at the end, we collect product data. We um, issue certificates of analysis. We um, acquire large amounts of detailed data about our production, as well as the stability of the product long term. And um, in summary, we can say that then, through the various stages of data acquisition from procurement to end use, we are collecting large number of data then from vendors supplied, from information that we collect during QC inspection, but there is a aspect here, a third component, that is what we call the hidden supply chain data. That is, what happens when the provider of single-use manufacturers, or prior even to them, the components were produced? Were there any manufacturing events that affected the material? Are there raw material changes, polymers, or additives that we need to be aware of. So all of this needs to work together. And also all this information needs to be presented in a manner that is representative of our process. So in the case of MES, for example, that will enable the acquisition of the genealogy and the traceability. And for that, we will require open data models that allow us to extract data out of MES and later summarize that information with data from other sources to obtain a general visualization of the impact or potential impact of changes to single use and other materials on our product quality and yield. And now I'm gonna turn over to Mark Maselli, who's gonna give you some examples of how we use analytics at Shire in relation to single use systems. Thank you, Gloria. This slide demonstrates an output of information compiled with our analytic system. As you can see, this model represents a quantitative analysis of the process contact surface area by subcomponents. When we say subcomponents, we're speaking about items that make up single-use systems or assemblies, such as tubing, bag films, or connectors. Each item is modeled based on its unique geometry 
to evaluate the exact process contact surface area of concern. We were able to use this information to model process steps or full product runs and identify the critical materials based on quantifiable value. This information enables us to analyze this in more depth. This next model utilizes the information above to analyze the cumulative extractables by chemical. These models are simplified for the purpose of this presentation, but you can imagine these would get very complex as more single-use components are used in the production of your product. Traditional practice is to analyze each component or assembly individually, which is very tedious and labor-intensive. Understand that these models need to be continually updated as change occurs, which is simplified by the use of analytical software. Single-use adoption requires the end users to establish a programmatic approach for the inception, use, and maintenance of, product, of a product life cycle. This process is most useful if it is established before the installation, but it can be applied at any time. Shires found that programmatic approaches, which we identify as a single-use life cycle, helps us to facilitate the communication internally between departments that are not uh, familiar with working together and with our suppliers. This relationship is established very early on. The importance of working collaboratively with vendors by communicating the intended use and system requirements of these single-use assemblies sets the stage for the success of these projects moving forward and the success of your collaborative relationship. Vendor literature and testing can be a major, major advantage but it is recommended to have defined validation approaches to manage this documentation properly. A full understanding of the production schedule with the defined bill of materials helps quantify raw material forecasting, which establishes a usage cadence with your supplier, hopefully eliminating any business continuity impact. And then this life cycle can also help internally by defining an approach to efficiently manage material specifications, because as Gloria spoke to earlier, there's a lot more raw materials to manage, how you manage your ERP data, and how you manage the risk associated with those materials. All these things are, are critical to maintaining business continuity moving forward. And every great business program requires the need to sustain the process. By continuing to work collaboratively with your supplier, even after you installed this equipment, you're able to maintain change management through a, a, a proper vendor change notification process, react to issues with corrective actions. As John spoke to about failures, the next step is to work with your vendors to address those failures and make sure that you can address them in a timely manner and continuously monitor and evaluate your system performance. Again, this is all very valuable information if you're working with your vendor to help improve your process moving forward. In summary, the adoption of single use brings significant benefits, but presents unique technical and operational challenges. The importance of understanding and documenting the impact this has in your production systems should be well understood. And that's where the life cycle can help you really understand how that impacts your procedural updates, how you manage processes, how you manage your validation. So Shire suggests that a programmatic approach be applied early to help guide you through this management process and in include the right players, the right departments up front. And finally, the importance of a collaborative working relationship between an end user and supplier is critical to the success, successful adoption of single-use systems. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to our presentation. We hope you have found this very practical. We will now turn the presentation back over to Cherie to introduce the next presenter. Thank you very much, Mark uh, and Gloria and John. So just as a reminder to our listeners, if you have any questions for Gloria, Mark, John, or Ken, then please click on the questions tab and send them to us. We will be asking these at the end of the presentation. I would now like to invite the speaker for the second half of this presentation, Kenneth Clapp, to present an industry perspective. Welcome, Ken. 
Uh, thank you, Shree, for that introduction, and thank you to Gloria, John, and Mark. That was a great presentation, great discussion. I'd like to follow up now with the supplier's perspective and our recognition and acknowledgement of our involvement in the new single-use life cycle. We include this safe harbor state statement since I may present concepts which may or may not be generally available to the industry at large. So let's get started. As the earlier part of the presentation highlighted, single-use technology implementation has had a wide-ranging impact on the end user or drug maker's manufacturing process. In consideration of our role as suppliers of systems and components to the industry and contributor to this life cycle, we too want to emphasize what we see as part of a paradigm shift as well as the opportunities it offers. With single-use systems and components, sourcing and procurement takes place in a highly intertwined supply chain. Production planning takes on new significance to ensure reliable, timely supply of end products, both single-use components and drug products to the market. The availability of information and the proper management of data has never been more important. This paradigm shift also offers an opportunity to change old ways of working and implement new ones which are more effective. Sharing data is a two-way street and holds tremendous promise in improving operational performance for the supplier and drug maker alike. Collaboration can streamline regulatory compliance support and increase the efficiency with which therapeutics reach patients. Buyer-supplier relationship is now changed forever. Within the biopharmaceutical industry, suppliers and drug makers are part of the process that brings therapeutic agents to market. Each organization focuses on the core competencies relevant to their individual businesses, with quality being number one, including sourcing, operations, and all of these which end in a reliable supply of products to the marketplace. These are parallel activities with common objectives by each organization. For reference, I've included the simplified representation of a biomanufacturing line from nutrients and media through cell culture and downstream processing to at least bulk drug product or substance. In the multi-use stainless steel scenario, these three data areas have been very compartmentalized with only some of the information being relevant and available outside the drug maker's organization with an emphasis on process data for workable equipment designs. In the single-use scenario, workflow data becomes much more important and equipment data in general may become particularly useful in the future as within the context of digital industrial. And although these KPIs shown increasing productivity, increasing yield, increasing quality, and decreasing variability are meant to reflect those of the drug maker, they are nonetheless appropriate for the supplier's manufacturing process as well. Looking at the supply chain before single use, it was predominantly stainless steel systems and piping. The supply chain was discontinuous with a brief transient shared bid, buy, install interaction sequence, mostly coordinated through engineering companies. In this scenario, the supplier and end user are mainly independent and procurement compartmentalization was compartmentalized with limited or no ongoing relationship. Even repair parts like mechanical seals and simple single-use components like filter cartridges were available from the drug makers or available to the drug makers from sub-suppliers to suppliers, maintaining that independence. I believe most of us are already familiar with the single-use benefits, and a number of them were mentioned earlier today. This image is instructive in showing a more detailed view 
of the up and downstream process trains assembled with single-use technology, including, including systems like totes and mixers, bioreactors, and purification equipment, as well as a variety of tubing sets, assemblies, flow kits, all the pieces that make up a complete single-use life cycle process train today. With this level of integration and incorporation, industry questions related to standardization, the management of critical quality attributes, and how best to address regulatory uncertainties come up routinely and are being answered. In the single-use case, equipment, systems, and many of the components are highly specific to each supplier. Use and operation is integrated and dependent. The single-use case introduces important supplier and user interaction areas around the more complex consumables as well as the single-use specific automation requirements. Make the point in a different way, consider the multi-use and single-use differences in these essential topic areas. Equipment in the multi-use case was mostly engineered to order. In the single-use case, configured to order. Repair parts like steam traps and mechanical seals, uh, and in the multi-use case and the single-use case, fewer spare parts are required due to the lack of complexity in the equipment. Consumables in the multi-use case, mostly associated with filter elements, probes, and a few items like that. Whereas in the single-use case, it's really the bulk of the system. As Gloria mentioned before, 71% of their manufacturing process is made up of single-use systems. And in automation, multi-use systems were often highly automated, making them very simple and easy to operate. And in the single-use case, automation is either non-existent as manual or semi-automatic at best. The image on the right is representative of the drug maker's internal data sources and information, information management systems, inclusive of enterprise resource planning, ERP, manufacturing execution systems, MES, and the related infrastructure. And recalling the biomanufacturing baseline from before, we see equipment, process, and workflow data represented as, integral, as an integral foundation to this process. Manufacturing integration of single-use systems and components is central to this paradigm shift. With many customers, including Shire, we have seen that the transparency, communication, and planning yields the best success. And a programmatic approach, as they highlighted, is really essential to the overall process. Raw plastic materials are converted into the various single-use components such as single-use films, tubing, connectors, and other bits and pieces. Visibility around the manufacturing method, pre- and post-irradiation material characteristics, and biocompatibility, the depth and complexity of the supply chain and the shared sub-suppliers help align the organizations and also helps identify areas where materials, suppliers, and finished single-use items are interchangeable. Sharing information starts with communication of needs and capabilities. Drug manufacturing schedules drive demand forecasts for systems and components. Item masters or material master setup should be a focal point because it is the definition of the supplier's product within the drug maker's organization. And to that end, supplier documentation such as drawings, bills of materials, and certificates of analysis can be associated with the item master right from the beginning. It is important then that the supplier, for the supplier to know and understand this essential use, which supplier documentation does the drug maker require, and how does it get associated with the item master. Understanding how each party's change management process works and how one affects the other is vital. And an agreed upon approach to incident investigation should be decided at an early point.
Supply agreements have taken a new importance in the single-use era. They can serve to codify the specific commitments around the use of single-use technology. Single-use technology incorporation dictates opera that operational analysis must now be extended to include delivery, receipt inspection, installation, setup confirmation, use, interchangeability, and disposal. Equipment design should consider single-use component tie points, including guides, channels, and holders, the orientation of the single-use assemblies, access, and complementary labeling. Consumables design, of course, must be robust, but integration and operation can be improved with proper labeling, a thorough understanding of the interfaces and interconnectivity, as well as not being overly complex. With respect to equipment site automation, questions come up about is this equipment standalone as an island of automation or is it fully integrated into the site automation infrastructure with S88 and S95 integration for unit and overall business operation. Additionally, what will the equipment's contribution be to the electronic batch records? In consideration of the consumable specific automation, Questions about will the automation system be used to enforce operational consistency? Withhold and confirmation events associated with the various single-use activities, such as setup or replacement. How will this be used to tie back to the batch record and support trace traceability, the genealogy that Gloria mentioned earlier? I've provided here an example of um, a simple example of a filter cartridge as a single component that could be sourced from multiple suppliers and highlights the incorporation into the item master. Each vendor could have different content, format, or delivery medium, which creates a certain level of complexity at the outset. And as the Shire folks uh, highlighted there are numerous components involved in making up the bill of materials for a manufacturing run. So we can see how this possible complexity grows exponentially. Putting it all together and extending the simple example just shown, here we now include such things as tubing sets and more highly complicated bag assemblies such as the bioreactor bag shown here. This myriad item, these myriad items, each with their own item master provides a better overall perspective on what makes up a single use manufacturing lines, bill of materials, and the traceability as part of the batch record. By comparison, the data provided by suppliers in support of multi-use equipment was primarily contained in the contents of the turnover package, including stainless steel material certificates, welding documents, and elastomer material certificates for O-rings and valve diaphragms. Whereas now, with single-use systems and components, the data goes beyond just the turnover package with requirements extending to the film, tubing, and a large number of the other plastic components for manufacturing process information, biological compatibility, and leachable and extractable data. That was a double, got to go back, sorry. With the initiatives such as those by BPOG for the standardization of extractables and leachables testing, as well as other biological compatible compatibility certification, suppliers are able to consistently provide such data. Standardization and consistency allows individual analytics to be combined to create a larger set of data with the benefit of, est of establishing better regulatory compliance. Again, with reference to the baseline process flow diagram, it's worth noting the workflow within the drug maker's operation contains valuable information to collect for themselves, but also to share with suppliers regarding point of use feedback. Feedback such as packaging, effectiveness, labeling, 
and modes of failure. This is the core manufacturing operation. In the multi-use case, the supplier has had limited involvement in the ERP or MES setup and integration. However, with the single-use case, the workflow considerations extend beyond those typically associated with manufacturing operation. The single-use supplier now has an opportunity to collaborate and share data it has gathered from its own operation and also from numerous end-user organizations to improve critical steps before manufacturing, namely inspection and staging. Done properly, data and information sharing combined with training can identify aberrations, reduce failures, and improve the readiness for manufacturing, ultimately increasing the successful manufacturing operations. In summary, the issues, single-use technology has established a greater interde interdependence between suppliers and end users. Supplier end user dynamics have changed no longer as it once was it was a once and done relationship. With single use, it is an ongoing relationship. Material properties impact per process performance. Demand forecasting trickles down to the supply chain, starting with the drug maker's forecast. Both parties benefit from analytics to drive continuous improvement separately and jointly. We see in the solution suppliers Sub-suppliers, drug makers, and regulatory bodies have been and will continue to adapt to this change. Being transparent with one another helps align common objectives. Communicating needs and supplying information facilitates the coordination of activities throughout the supply chain. Being able to plan properly improves the integration and operation of systems and components alike. The result of all this collaboration is the greater availability of quality, of quality therapeutics. A great deal is, of this combined presentation has in, involved the availability of information and data across the supply chain, from raw materials to marketed drugs. In particular, shared data from various parties combined to create deeper lakes of data. From these deeper lakes, from these deeper sources of data, rivers of, inf of actionable information flows. This liberation of data will help biomanufacturing be part of the fourth industrial revolution. And this is a graphic representation of the biomanufacturing baseline I've shown a few times before, re-envisioned within the context of digital industrial to establish a new baseline. This new baseline includes agnostic hardware and software connectivity, a new level of data aggregation used for insight and action, and where unit operation analytics and process-wide analytics draw upon large reservoirs of industrial data and at some point provide prescriptive instead of reactive activities for better process outcomes. I want to thank you for your attention today. Thank you to BioPharmAsia for this forum. And now back to you, Sri. Thank you very much, Ken. So at this point, I would like to begin the question and answer session. So our first question is for Mark. Um, how can you influence your organization to work more collaboratively with your suppliers? Thank you, Shri. So what, one of the things that I've done internally, um, as, as an engineer and supporting the floor for a while, I was, was able to start facilitating conversations um, working through the materials management groups. And what this allowed me to do is get a better understanding of single use. Um, it's helped me um, collaborate even internally with other peers, engineering peers, to get them involved as well. So I think it's important to really 
understand that everyone needs to learn a little bit more about single use. You're really creating these, these hybrid, hybrid personnel. Um, another thing that we've done is we've engaged with, with the suppliers or even in some cases the manufacturers in order to understand best practices for how to install equipment, how to handle the equipment. Um, it's really about more than just having the conversation between materials management and the vendor, but to ha have this conversation with more involved parties and departments within the organization that's utilizing single use. Great. Uh, the next one is for Ken. Um, have supply agreements changed in recent years related to single use technology application? Uh, yes, thanks for that question. Yes, uh, supply agreements have incrementally grown in their incorporation of specific elements tied to single use activity. Um, not only, let's say in the beginning, it was more around uh, just quality and uh, assurance of supply. But now it goes into actually supporting the operations with specific training objectives, uh, sometimes tying certain objectives to the overall outcome of the supply agreement and the relationship. So I expect that the, the agreements will continue to evolve as more is known about the use of single-use technology manufacturing and the reliance on it becomes more critical. Um, it, it's become clear also that as the um, single-use technology has been applied, the realization that the two parties or the multiple parties, suppliers and end users, are tied together, it's in everyone's best interest to get everything down on paper and allows everyone to track it and uh, stay on target. Great. Uh, the next question hasn't uh, specified who to specifically, but jump in there if you think you've got the answer. Um, what solutions would you suggest to better manage or facilitate data sharing between suppliers and sub-suppliers. Is there any guidance on that at all? Anyone want to give that one a go? Uh, this is this Ken. I mean, one, one comment I'll make is I think that in, in looking at um, the interaction in the industry, if, if I look back at some of the earlier discussions, uh, equipment supply, in the ASME BPE organization, um, there was not a great deal of discussion or consensus among suppliers on certain topics, especially single use began to be introduced. But now the reliance has grown enough where um, multiple single use uh, end users recognize the value of agreeing on such things as just leachable and extractable test parameters. With that, you know, the ability to to manage process data and uh, supply chain data through the manufacturing process will, will be improved. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is uh, for Gloria. What specific recommendations do you have about the implementation of electronic systems in plants that operate with single use? Yes, uh, I'll say there are Many considerations, but um, in general, I would say the ones that we really need to keep in mind is that, let's think of th two things here. One is the systems themselves and the, function the functionality that they have to contain, but also the interfaces. Um, by nature, these um, processes with single use are more manual. So we need to be very mindful of that. And, um, design and implement an interface between automation and NES that allows uh, the process to stop, go through the changeovers, and resume. The other thing is that the NES system itself needs to contain functionality that allows to uh, consume and replace the material in the middle of an operation and account correctly for that inventory consumption and reflect it correctly in the genealogy. But most of all, needs to allow for the change to happen, replace the component, and continue. So we'll say that those are key items there. And then um, the third one would be in regards to process data analytics, that we need to have systems that allow us to replicate or represent correctly what happens in the physical world, in the physical process, 
we need to have accurate representations of our operations in the, in the analytic system and then associate to the various steps the actual data and run the analysis and produce the report that we have anticipated. But if we don't have the right functionality, it's not really possible to create those analysis. The last thing I would say about analytics there is that we almost have to walk backwards. We need to anticipate what kind of analysis, what kind of reporting we want to see, and then configure the data correctly. I would say that that applies in general to um, any process data analytics. But in particular, in this case, it's important because we need to we rely on the availability of data from the vendors and their suppliers. So all of that needs to be anticipated. I will say that those are the key areas to keep in mind. Thank you very much, Gloria. Uh, next one is for Ken. Has single-use product development changed to reflect end-user needs? Uh, yes, uh, I think especially new product development has most definitely changed. I think that uh, what we see today, and, and we have an example of a, a new film that's been developed um, really from scratch to address a, a probably a decade and a half's worth of input from across the industry. So I think the focus is on uh, getting materials that go into a finished end product, a single-use product that meets the broadest section uh, of requirements, uh, particularly on biocompatibility, um, robustness in the case of film, and uh, security of supply, because those things, are, those things resonate with virtually every end user organization that we talk to. So it's, it's no longer, say, um, driven by the convenience or accessibility of a particular plastic raw material. It's really about engineering materials that are specific to the appropriate application in biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, next one is from Mark. You spoke about the importance of a uh, programmatic approach. Do you have any recommendations on how to maintain vendor change management as part of this program? Yeah, thank you, Sri. So with this, one of the things we learned the hard way is the, that things are always going to change, right? And so when I spoke even about the data analytics, uh, the awareness that there will be change and how do you manage that change without making, having to basically reinvent everything you've done. So I, I think the important part to do, is, to do with that is when you're making change, when you're designing systems, you want to understand that there will be change. When you're um, designing a validation pro pro or program or approach, you want to make sure that it's not going to be extremely labor intensive with no value added. You really want to, to establish a program that is a, a little more modular in its approach so that you can do pieces based on what the value-added activities are. An example of that would be if change management comes through and a vendor says they're changing their manufacturing site, the process is staying the same and the materials are staying the same, I don't want to requalify everything. I want to just focus on what changed. And I want to make sure that I can document that and amend that to existing information. Um, other experiences we've had on this are how we set up a system to make sure that we're not impacting uh, every procedure, just parts of procedures as things change or components change or materials change. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, the next question is for Ken. Automation was mentioned in the context of single-use integration. Are there, any, are there any specific recommendations to improve manufacturing operations? Yeah, thanks, Shri. Um, yeah, I think in general what we see is that, you know, a purposeful approach to analyzing the manufacturing process, you know, things as simple as, you know, what two pieces of equipment are going to be adjacent to each other and how do they connect. Um, when a single-use component is involved and there's some level of automation, um, to review that connectivity, that operation in that context is important so that if there are opportunities for the automation to enforce um, operational consistency, it should be taken. 
Um, you know, is, is it a single confirmation that a connection was made? Is it a double confirmation? Uh, will there be the use of, of electronic methods like proximity sensors or barcode scanning to ensure that things are connected properly and actually used at the right, you know, the right tubing set or right assemblies in the right place at the right time? Um, you know, avoiding some of the change out issues that Shire mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I think it's it gets down to really allowing um, the supplier into the drug maker's organization and sharing what that process, that manufacturing process looks like operationally and working on it collabor collaboratively to come up with the right solution for the automation. Because, you know, the, the thing that was true about the multi-use case of stainless steel is a lot of the work, a lot of the piping was all fixed and um, highly automated with valves and limit switches and, and other things to tell you what was um, connected and what was not connected. You don't have that same luxury of single use. So other me methods and measures have to be taken. Thank you very much, Ken. So that seems like all the questions that we've had through today. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our presenters, Dr. Gloria Gadea lopez Mark Maselli, John McGuire, and Kenneth Clapp for sharing their knowledge with us. Audiences can view this webinar on demand by visiting biopharma-asia.com and feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues who are also interested um, in this topic. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you. Thank you.